we had about uh, close to 90 people register for today's event. We're up to 55 and it seems to be tailing off. So we're almost five minutes past the hour. I think I'll, I'll jump right in. A few new attendees joined. So introductions. My name is Dave Arscott. I'm executive director at Stroudwater Research Center located in Avondale, Pennsylvania. Welcome to today's webinar that's hosted by the Garden Club of Hartford. And I will be sharing thoughts on restoring and protecting water quality and mitigating flooding in rural landscapes. And have some pictures on my cover slide here that illustrate some of the work that Stroudwater Research Center is involved with in rural landscapes, in planting trees along streams, working with farmers and uh, farm field management and helping manage stormwater runoff and other uh, aspects of these rural landscapes. I'd certainly like to thank Margaret Heiner, Sally Wiseman, and Agnes Peel, uh, helping to host uh, this webinar from the Garden Club of Hartford. So thank you for the invitation. And I look forward to sharing the details over the next hour. I'll try to limit my comments to 45 minutes and uh, field questions towards the end. I have plenty of slides to keep us going. So uh, we'll see if I get through it all before the Q&A period comes. Uh, we've disabled your audio, uh, so you're all on mute. And if you have questions during the webinar, uh, feel free to add those into the Q&A box. And I have with me today, hiding in the wings, our assistant director, uh, Scott Ensign, to help, help me uh, get to your questions at the end. Uh, so he may also be interacting with you all in the chat box. So a uh, brief introduction about Stroud Water Research Center. Our, as I mentioned, we're located in Southeast Pennsylvania, about 40 minutes outside uh, west of Philadelphia. Our mission is to advance knowledge and stewardship of freshwater systems through global research, education, and watershed restoration. We established in 1967 as a field station of the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia. But we are now a wholly independent 501c3 nonprofit. I've been with the Stroud Center for more than 15 years. I'm a research scientist, a stream ecologist slash watershed scientist. I try to keep tabs on all the different projects and programs that are staff of more than 50 employees uh, keep going and the great work that they all do, I'll be sharing with you today in this theme of uh, restoration in rural landscapes. If, uh, if you're new to the Stroud Center, we have a web presence, stroudcenter.org, check us out. There's an amazing amount of information on our website and we also have a number of social media channels that you can follow. And uh, on our website, we have an events page that announces future webinars and events, uh, just like this one. So check those out if you're interested in hearing more and connecting with us. So today's topic, uh, restoring and protecting water quality and mitigating flooding in rural landscapes. Uh, perhaps you've been out in severe rainstorms and seen uh, these sorts of events. Uh, this happens to be a farm field uh, just behind my house where in 2014 we had a really heavy rainfall uh, event uh, that produced a lot of overland flow and uh, really muddy water that was running down to the creek. And this is sort of the context of much of what I'm going to share today. But also I view these in the context of present and future challenges and I think I'd just like to name a few uh, that are, are really serious challenges for our, our global uh, society. And of course, there's a lot of uh, awareness now about climate change and the potential uh, rain patterns and temperature patterns in your geography. 
we're in the middle of a global pandemic uh, that seems last one is more than 100 years ago. Of course, there's other uh, diseases and unwanted pests that I kind of lump into this category of significant challenges. We have increasing human populations and, and our infrastructure uh, expansion. And with that often comes pollution in many forms, air pollution, water pollution. And food production is uh, a pretty big challenge, especially as our population increases and climates change and change uh, what we can grow, when we can grow, where we can grow food. And from the lens that, that I think about these present and future challenges, uh, certainly I can connect all of these in some way to water and freshwater systems, whether they impact the quality and quantity of water or uh, water as an important resource for the environment and for humans. And so that's the lens that I, I view these through and the lens that I'm gonna share uh, some of our work with you all today. So down here in blue, just is a little bit of an outline of what I'm gonna share with you at Stroudwater Research Center. Uh, we conduct education, restoration and research activities. I'm gonna focus more on our research and watershed restoration projects. Talk a little bit about managing landscapes for flooding and drought resilience, improving our agricultural practices for better environmental outcomes. I get into some uh, of the concerns about uh, what we term emerging contaminants like pesticides and other chemical compounds that we're finding in the environment and thinking about not just the environmental health risk, but the human health risk uh, of those emerging contaminants. And I'll end with uh, presenting a little bit on new and emerging crops and thinking about environmental impacts of those. So as I've alluded to, much of our current work is in rural agricultural landscapes. And I will be specifically talking about stormwater runoff management to reduce flooding, building better soil health for agricultural production. Uh, we have a new, couple new projects uh, that we're involved with, looking at emerging contaminants, specifically neonicotinoids and PFAS, polyfluoroalkyl substances that you may or may not be aware of. Uh, and I'll see if I have enough time to share with you uh, some of the new work we're doing around uh, hemp and hemp production, hemp fiber production. A little bit more context here. This is a little bit dated 2008 to uh, 2009 report, National Rivers and Streams Assessment from the US EPA revealed that 56% of our nation's stream and river miles are in poor condition, meaning that uh, they don't support healthy populations of aquatic insects and other invertebrates and or fish. And that report identified many different stressors and reasons for those problems that relate to chemical stressors and physiological, uh, physical stressors, like excess streams, bed sediments, and uh, habitat uh, impacts, riparian vegetative cover problems, and riparian disturbances. Uh, there is an updated report from the EPA in 2013 to 2014, that reanalyzes some of those data and presents uh, more recent data. There's, a, there's also an, another assessment underway uh, that was carried out in 2018 and 19, uh, but the results haven't been published yet. Uh, this might be a little challenging to read on the screen, but the top panel there uh, is the good, fair, poor, and, and not assessed estimates of percent of stream miles in each of those categories for macroinvertebrates, the middle panel is for fish, and the bottom panel is for phosphorus. And the main point here is that in 2013-2014 report, 
um, there were still um, significant stream miles in poor conditions. And in some cases, like for fish, this red bar over on the right side suggests that things have gotten a little bit worse for fish. 10% more stream miles were identified as degraded for fish. And the same is for uh, phosphorus down here on the bottom, about 10% more. And um, I'm just showing macroinvertebrates, fish, and phosphorus, but that report also looked at these other stressors uh, over to the right that I've listed. So why, uh, why is, uh, what, what, what are the reasons that our streams are in such poor condition? Uh, well, of course, it depends on where you are uh, and what's going on in the locale. Uh, but uh, the reports have identified about 40% of stream miles with high phosphorus, 27% with high nitrogen, uh, poor vegetated cover, high level of human disturbance, and excess levels of stream bed sediment. And the map on the left just shows you that the report further breaks down the geographies across the United States, if you're interested in um, learning more about this assessment. And the point that I'd make here is that many of these stressors listed here can be addressed by uh, best management implementation in our rural landscapes. And what we mean by that are deploying forested riparian buffers or even grassland riparian buffers adjacent to our waterways, considering soil health improvements in our agricultural lands and uh, whole farm management plans. These are all aspects that Straw Water Research Centers intimately involved with in our work. And that, that takes on another level of impact that work when we consider how much agricultural land there is throughout the United States. The picture on the left highlights those agricultural lands extending down into Mexico and up into Canada uh, and shows the extent of that, the, our agricultural lands in that bright green uh, color. And on the right, we just have a table of land use across the United States, land cover and land use. And you'll see that agriculture at 17% and grasslands and pasture at 17% account for uh, quite a bit of the acreage of how our uh, uh, humans have an imprint across the United States uh, with urban areas accounting for about 2% of the land area in the United States. So there's a, there's a lot of work, a lot of territory to cover here by working in the rural landscapes and a, a huge potential to fix or reduce the problems facing our uh, freshwater systems. Uh, this next slide sort of shows our philosophy and how we move through understanding how natural streams and rivers and watersheds function, recognizing that our watersheds are impaired or have some degradation or altered, and that we recognize that our restoration activities uh, may not fully restore watersheds to their natural condition. Uh, so that, that ending point in our restoration work may not necessarily be to return to a completely natural watershed. It's just not realistic. Uh, here, our society needs agricultural lands for production. We need our urban environments and our cities. Uh, and you know, we, these are all parts of our uh, socioeconomic system here and globally. Of course, water management uh, is thought about a lot here at Stroud Water Research Center. And particularly in our geography, water management and planning for flood resiliency is, is sort of a top issue in our region. I'm gonna share with you a number of projects that uh, we've been working on in the last five to 10 years, starting with this one, funded by both the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, 
to restore flood uh, attenuation and ecological resiliency in mid-Atlantic Piedmont. And here we focus on a watershed right outside the door of Strawwater Research Center, namely the East Branch of White Clay Creek, which flows into the Delaware uh, River at Wilmington, Delaware. And the picture there shows a farm field up on the left, uh, just coming out of winter into spring uh, after some heavy rains. A best management practice that we've installed at the uh, sort of the bottom slope of that farm field called a uh, swale or a level spreader. And then to the right of that, uh, some tree tubes that are uh, where we're planting our riparian uh, restoration project, riparian forest buffer. And in this small watershed, uh, we've, we've created sort of a demonstration condition where we've deployed as many BMPs as we can with uh, quite a bit of support from our local landowners that have allowed us and uh, allowed us to work on their lands and, uh, and help uh, deploy these strategies. So this project resulted in about 75 acres of forested riparian buffers, three miles of these swales throughout the watershed, typically at the base of a row crop field. We've restored about an acre and a half of a floodplain wetland adjacent to White Clay Creek. And we've also added large woody debris piles in about four miles of small feeder streams uh, throughout the watershed. And I'll give you a little pictorial tour in just a moment. But you know, the goals of these strategies here are to reduce sediment, pathogens, nitrogen phosphorus pollution, uh, help mitigate or uh, reduce flooding and excessive runoff and protect the stream's base flow temperature, particularly during the summer. We do have some cool and cold water sensitive species here and our hot summer uh, climate uh, sometimes can exceed the thresholds for, for example, trout, brown trout in our uh, watershed. So here's a, a picture of a nearby uh, farm field and uh, you can kind of see the hill slope here down into the valley and some uh, trees off in the distance there. This is one landowner that allowed us to come in and uh, reforest this area to create the riparian forest buffer. The tree tubes are there to help protect the trees during the early stages of growth from deer browse and vole damage and uh, and provide sort of a light climate that helps them grow uh, vertically a little bit faster. Here's an, another local area where we've done the same. You can, I'm standing up on the ridge taking this photo, looking down slope, you can see off in the distance, the tree tubes uh, sort of in an arcing pattern along the stream uh, here. And if we get up closer, uh, you can see those were planted in 2007, 2008. And just to give you an idea, after seven years, 2014, uh, we had a forested area where the canopy was starting to close and, and potentially shade that stream. So, you know, the maturity of these kind of best management practices might take 10 to 15 years to develop what we're hoping. I see a uh, a question in there, what kind of trees? We usually recommend and prefer a um, mix of natives and uh, choose the species to be uh, appropriate for the soil conditions and soil moisture. Uh, we have a list of the species on our website that uh, we commonly work with. We also may plant shrubs or tall growing trees and we work with the landowners uh, to provide a mix and a planting plan um, that, that they would also like. Now we know that planting buffers around stream channels can reduce these pollutants uh, that I've been talking about, nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment, and other pollutants. And in fact, we've done research over our history to document this. This is just one study that Dr. Dennis Newbold here at the Stroud Center uh, was involved with among others uh, in a nearby farming system where we uh, implemented this 
riparian forest buffer and this uh, swale, this conservation swale, and monitored nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment for you know, the better part of 10 years and documented uh, after that time period reductions in nitrogen sediment uh, that were significant. The phosphorus story is a little bit more complicated. As you can see there, the, uh, we did document a, a reduction in the particulate phosphorus being captured by that forest buffer and processed, but that material leaves and other organic material also decomposes and um, then the dissolved phosphorus continues to move through the soil system and the hydrologic system. Uh, so in the end, that study uh, didn't show a conclusive reduction in phosphorus, but other studies have, particularly for particulate phosphorus. Now it's not just nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. I'm borrowing from other studies here. This one's on atrazine, showing that um, the re removal efficacy or efficiency of this buffered area is significant with regard to atrazine between the crops and, and the river as well. Thought you'd enjoy a closer up picture of one of these, uh, these swales that uh, are also called level lip spreaders. Uh, leveled lip because the berm on the left side here or the downslope side needs to be very level so that if there's too much water that enters this uh, rain garden, that it overflows the hill slope gently and without creating concentrated flow paths that would create erosion on the downstream side of the ditch or the, the swale. And you can see the row crop up on the right side. This, this is a, a nice sunny day after a big rainstorm a couple of days before. These typically uh, infiltrate and the water disappears over a couple of days after a big rainstorm. Now with this project, we also um, did some uh, modeling, hydrologic modeling to estimate the uh, benefit for all of this flood storage capacity that we've added into the project. And with those three miles of these swales and uh, some of the other best management practices, uh, we, we can show that our models can reduce more than 10% uh, of a uh, two year uh, or two inch 24 hour storm event. Uh, and that, that may be enough to ameliorate downstream flooding or overbank flooding. Of course, that's not all with this project. I mentioned the large wood debris. Uh, this wood debris, of course, can slow stormwater flow and the downstream movement of sediment and improve uh, habitat for the aquatic animals and plants that live in the stream. Uh, and it can alter the processes that form and shape the stream channel, uh, which uh, also has some benefits for the habitat and aquatic life. Now we, we have put these large wood pieces in very small streams so that um, floods won't necessarily mobilize these large pieces of wood and create uh, problems downstream against bridges or other infrastructure. And in some cases, we may even cable tie uh, some of these streams in uh, to fix them in place. Now, this is also a, a standard practice that's happening out west in the Pacific Northwest with the um, salmon restoration efforts uh, as we learn uh, quite a bit about the importance of wood for fish spawning and aquatic organisms. The last piece of the puzzle for this project was a small wetland uh, restoration or creation project in the floodplain of White Clay Creek. You can see the three pictures pre, during, and post construction. Uh, this is sort of a pocket wetland that uh, was sculpted out of the low lying landscape adjacent to the stream to um, allow for overbank flooding uh, to be captured and stored in this wetland for a period of time. And as the floodwaters recede, then that water slowly moves back into the channel. So this is another way of uh, attenuating downstream flooding impacts, uh, of which uh, White Clay Creek flows to Newark, Delaware, and into Wilmington, where there's built infrastructure and flooding is a significant concern in those uh, downstream neighboring communities. So I'll move, move on to a, a different project 
slightly different subject, uh, that of soil health. You know, for a long time, Stroudwater Research Center and our, our science and restoration activities have focused on um, how to protect streams um, with utilizing that land adjacent to streams to create buffers and these other management uh, strategies. Uh, but we've fully recognized the value of working in the upland area and working with farmers and landowners to uh, implement other best management practices that can ultimately have a benefit to our streams and rivers as well. Uh, we're uh, part of the Pennsylvania Soil Health Coalition. There's a nice web page you can go to to learn more about soil health. I'll show you in just a moment. This um, It's a, a broad uh, coalition. You can see some of our collaborators there on the left, and this is uh, funded by uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, EPA, and the Chesapeake Bay Program. Uh, the, sort of the recent uh, launching of the website where you can learn more about soil health is here. This is pasoilhealth.org, uh, where you can get more uh, information and materials on this topic like this one. So what are, what are we talking about soil health? Uh, think of a, a farm field or your garden and um, the soil health principles we're talking about to build a healthier soil ecosystem and benefit water quality are to minimize disturbance, maximize soil cover, maximize biodiversity, and maximize continuous living roots. And under each of those topics are examples of practices that uh, contribute to those principles like no-till, reduced till, uh, mulching, uh, residue retention, cover crops, et cetera. Of course, agricultural soils are part of a complex ecosystem. They're living systems. Uh, they're fed by living uh, roots from the plants that are grown there that uh, stimulate the soil diversity, soil biology. They're, um, incredibly uh, useful to us in the form of uh, ecosystem services. Soils cycle nutrients, they sequester carbon, by building organic matter, and um, there's also healthy soils can uh, help keep disease and, and pests in check and build a better soil structure that allows for water infiltration, holds the soil in place uh, in high rain events, et cetera. And for, um, so really one of the prime metrics of soil health is how much organic matter uh, or carb, organic carbon is stored in that soil. The more we till, the more we leave our soils bare, the more that um, organic material is decomposed and has burned off over time. And um, what's recognized here in these soil health principles is um, healthy soil has a number one indicator of high organic matter content, you know, upwards of eight, seven, six, eight uh, percent organic matter. So for every percent increase in soil organic matter, soils can have an additional 17,000 to 25,000 gallons of water available per acre. Uh, so if, um, if you're growing corn or other crops, that's water that's available to your crops that you don't then need to irrigate during um, times of drought, particularly maybe during the onset of drought. There's a lot of measurements going on uh, to document these, documenting the, uh, organic, the organic material in soils, documenting how well these soils infiltrate water. Here's a picture of a double ring infiltrometer that's placed into the farm field or the ground, sealed tightly with the ground, and then you come out with a very large bucket of water and you fill that center ring up until uh, it's sort of stable and you turn the water spigot off, start a stopwatch and, and count how, how many seconds, how many minutes it takes for that water to infiltrate uh, through the ground. You do that many, many times and you get some average rates. And, you know, in, in some of the soils with higher organic matter, uh, these soils are infiltrating, you know, four to six inches uh, per hour. And uh, that's a, a really quite a remarkable infiltration rate. 
that can help in stormwater management. Now, you know, one of the uh, leaders in the soil health movement, Ray Archuleta, says, you know, we don't have a runoff problem, we have an infiltration problem. And that's a direct uh, uh, remark to, towards the importance of building soil health in our agricultural lands. Uh, there's, there's plenty of data out here that show uh, infiltration rates and different types of uh, crop uh, or field management practices. Here's one uh, such study that compares the percent change in infiltration rate for different ways that uh, croplands or grazing lands are managed. And we can see uh, cover cropping, perennial cover on those lands, uh, grazing exclusion and grazing management techniques uh, have increased the infiltration rate in some of those systems. So less runoff means less flooding. Less flooding means less sediment delivery or less runoff also means less sediment delivery, uh, less nutrient delivery. You know, excess sediment in our streams leads to loss of habitat, changes in stream morphology, and uh, not just the delivery of nutrients, but also other things that may come off the landscape either attached to the particles or dissolved, pesticides or other potential contaminants. And the more we infiltrate, the more water goes to our groundwater and um, groundwater is recharged. Uh, and that groundwater system can also filter some of our pollutants and process some of the pollutants. Uh, groundwater feeds our streams during the hot summer months, hot dry summer months. Uh, so it helps provide base flow to our streams, particularly in summer. And uh, it can also help keep that water temperature at a cooler level uh, as, as that system, water moves through the ground system. So the more uh, of these practices we put out there, uh, the less nutrient loss we have. Uh, it's not just about building up healthy soils, it's also about helping uh, manage the decision process of how much fertilizer and material to put on the farms. You know, only about half of the nitrogen fertilizer applied to our crops is actually absorbed by the crop itself. And the rest either infiltrates to the ground or runs off or is burned off in some way. Uh, there's also issues with uh, phosphorus as well, uh, as I've already mentioned. <clears throat> and of course, the nutrient loss off of our fields and open spaces uh, can drive excessive algal growth in our streams and lakes and ponds and rivers as well and create these nuisance or harmful uh, algal blooms in some cases that you may be hearing about. Cover crops is one of those best management practices that has been shown to help reduce uh, nitrate that moves off the of farm fields. Here's a figure showing uh, different cropping systems with cover crops against the no cover crop system. And you'll see that the poor water nitrate concentration is highest in the field with no cover crops. Uh, poor water is that water that's available in the soil, um, but not fully um, moving down into our groundwater. So at the, at the Stroud Center, we've been studying cover crop, no cover crop, among other things. Here's one of the field trials nearby the Stroud Center where we maintain one field in no cover crop and another in cover crop. I'm gonna move into um, sharing with you some of this work uh, with a number of different projects we have. Uh, one, of the, one of these projects on the field I just showed you in the photo uh, is funded in the past by uh, United States Department of Agriculture Conservation Innovation Grant uh, Program and now the Prince Albert uh, the second of Monaco Foundation with some follow-up studies. Uh, the map here is just showing where those farm fields are. Uh, the Stroud Center is, is located at the bottom center of your screen here. So um, we can easily get out to these fields and do our field research. Uh, we have another study site uh, at a place called the Stroud Preserve. It's about 20 minute drive from the Stroud Center. Uh, where we're collaborating with the Rodale Institute. They're um, fairly well known for um, their organic farming uh, practices and communicating about organic farming. 
This study is funded by the William Penn Foundation to uh, document and evaluate the differences between your traditional cropping uh, system, uh, like a conservation no-till, conservation till, and organic treatments. As we think about infiltration, soil health, runoff, and stream water quality uh, in this particular setting. This study is about three years old now, so I don't have um, the results to show you yet as introducing these practices takes some time to get robust uh, data. But I will share with you a couple highlights from the cover crop, no cover crop. At the edge of these fields, we've installed these wing dams to collect runoff or concentrate runoff coming off of those fields through a, a weir or a point there, that black V-shaped weir where we can stick a bottle under and collect water uh, during, an, uh, during storm events. And when we look at cover crop water, we see the bottle on the left. And when we look at no cover crop water coming off those fields, we see the bottle on the right. One's uh, a little bit heavier with sediment than the other. We can analyze uh, that in, in our lab for various things, for the suspended sediment that's there. So the top bar here shows uh, the cover crop on the left in the, uh, in the white box and no cover crop in the gray box. You can see the difference in suspended uh, sediment concentrations from a couple different sampling dates or uh, the two different fields uh, top and bottom there, sorry. And uh, here's an example of uh, nitrate, nitrogen coming off of those fields as well, where we can see uh, less nitrate coming off of the field on the cover crop and more on the no cover crop. Now recently in these fields, we've transitioned to add another uh, study where we are looking at seed coatings, um, that uh, see the differences in seeds uh, impregnated with an insecticide. Uh, that insecticide is called neonicotinoid. Neonicotinoid um, can be sprayed, but also is widely available as a, um, a seed coating on corn and soybean seeds. Uh, this is a, a pesticide then that when the plant germinates, the plant can take up this neonicotinoid and um, take on the properties of that uh, insecticide as a deterrent for uh, insect herbivory on the young plants. And you know, this uh, has been in use for many years now and it's a growing concern because we are documenting widespread uh, measurable concentrations of neonicotinoids in our environment. And there's been some recent studies that have linked uh, um, neonicotinoid uh, presence and abundance with the decline in uh, the RB population among other insects. Uh, it's a, a, a neurotoxin basically for the invertebrates uh, that uh, was thought to be uh, highly targeted and a better alternative than some of the other pesticides when it was first put on the marketplace. Why are they so uh, widely used? Uh, protects seedlings for up to 10 weeks, reduces the need for other types of pesticide sprays, and it replaced uh, some other pesticides also with known uh, issues and challenges with environmental contamination and human health concern. Today, neonicotinoid, uh, well, there's, there's a couple different compounds there. I'm showing one of the compounds, uh, just showing that it's widely uh, used on our agricultural lands, either as a seed coating or directly sprayed. Uh, this, if this particular map is estimates produced from uh, 2016. Uh, and, and then that same study shows what kind of crops uh, that, that chemical is used on and just how many uh, million pounds of this material is put out there on those crops. So it's a growing concern, it's of growing use. It gets into the food web uh, because the plant doesn't necessarily take up all of that neonicotinoid seed coating. So some of it can leach into the ground or run off and affect 
other uh, invertebrates. And in fact, then the animals that predate on those invertebrates, birds and uh, other pre predator uh, insects, et cetera. And there's been some, some recent work, maybe not so recent now, this is six or seven years out uh, from uh, the Netherlands that have shown declines in insectivorous birds associated with neonicotinoid concentrations. Um, there's a growing body of literature out here that's um, starting to point the finger at some of these compounds in the neonicotinoids. Um, our own data here are some very preliminary data from the fields that we have at um, where we have uh, uh, neonic seed coating and non-neonic seed coating. Uh, so uh, that's the yellow and the white side of the bars here showing higher concentrations in the overland flow water coming off of these fields from fields with um, neonicotinoid seeds uh, in them compared to non-neonicotinoid seeds. We're still measuring neonic uh, uh, chemical compounds in those non-neonic fields because there's a legacy of using those seeds in those fields. So we expect to see some decline over time, uh, but we'll continue this effort and uh, hopefully see that. Now we're getting close to the end here and I'll just briefly touch on a couple other hot topics uh, that we're working on. Uh, we, we just received word uh, late last winter that the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research uh, Program would fund some work here uh, for one of our scientists at the Stroud Center evaluating the risks of um, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances uh, for contamination of surface and groundwater through application of biosolids in agricultural systems. This is in collaboration with the Science, Technology, and Research Institute of Delaware uh, that will be doing the uh, analytical chemistry side of the work. What are PFOSs? As I've already mentioned, they're uh, polyfluoroalkyl alkyl substances. It's a, it's a family of compounds. There's more than 4,000 individual compounds. They're synthetic. They're started in production in the 1940s. Uh, they're parts of Teflon and other uh, and, uh, fire retardants you may have heard of. They're in a lot of different products. They're extremely hard to break down in the environment. And they're, so they're persistent organic contaminants. And um, there are human health concerns in addition to environmental health concerns with the wide uh, distribution of these chemicals in our environment. Uh, so some of the effects noted so far I'm listing here, uh, increased cholesterol levels, you know, some uh, infant birth weight uh, has been documented, uh, et cetera, thyroid hormone disruption. And there are studies that show that these are measurable compounds in some of our drinking water sources, most notably really a study out of Iowa uh, for groundwater uh, sources near Des Moines, I think first broke that back uh, five or six years ago. How do they get in the environment and, and the, what, what's the work that we're doing here? So PFOSs are fairly ubiquitous and are, um, we may have them in our homes in addition to fire retardants and Teflons. They move through our waste stream to our wastewater treatment plants to the landfill. And uh, those then find their way into leachate in the ground. Uh, when they go through a wastewater treatment plant, uh, wastewater treatment plants uh, also provide a service. They provide biosolids that can be a fertilizer to apply to our farm fields. So if, if our wastewater treatment plants have high concentrations of PFAS or even low concentrations of PFAS, but magnified over the uh, treatment process and biosolids are spread on our landscapes, as fertilizer, there's a route of contamination that we're interested in understanding more about. So this study is just getting off the ground. We are, um, you know, this, this is just the preliminary we, work we did to identify the potential in Pennsylvania. Um, these are the wastewater treatment plants that are permitted to produce biosolids for land application. 
Our colleagues down in Delaware have recently looked at PFAS concentrations in biosolids from wastewater treatment plants in Delaware and note that they're measurable. And the question then becomes, you know, are they also um, becoming a concern in our agricultural landscapes? So, you know, we will be doing some synoptic studies to uh, survey farms in Pennsylvania that are accepting biosolids as fertilizer for spread on uh, croplands and doing samples there uh, and, and look at how that material may move through those farm fields if we do find PFAS. And our uh, collaborators will be developing some more analytical methods uh, for more easily quantifying these compounds. All right, I'm a little bit over, but I'm almost there. And I'll just quickly share with you uh, the work we're doing here at the Stroud Center involved with hemp and hemp fiber production. <clears throat> Our goal here is to better understand uh, how hemp crop influences soil health and water quantity and quality availability. Uh, there's, there's a lot of literature out there about possible environmental benefits of hemp. And keep in mind here, I'm focused on hemp fiber and maybe hemp uh, grain production, um, not the uh, THC impregnated marijuana crop that's grown for uh, medicinal marijuana and now recreational marijuana in some geographies across the United States. Uh, of course, hemp fiber uh, can be, uh, find its way into many different products and have a lot of value for our purposes are, and also maybe a more uh, sustainable crop than fiber from cotton or jute or other uh, alternatives. Here we're just looking at seeding the farm field outside the Stroud Center with uh, the hemp seeds. This is a project in partnership with a number of other organizations. Uh, Jefferson University is interested in understanding the hemp fiber material for things like its uh, tensile strength and its appropriateness for different textiles, et cetera. So it's a, a nice partnership here. You know, the purported environmental benefits of hemp fiber and hemp, hemp crops in, in our environment or in our farming system have been to increase diversity within the cropping system, uh, that those roots then leach uh, material into the soil that might be beneficial for the microbes and improve soil health. They do have a tap root that has been documented to get up to maybe three feet in some plants that can help improve infiltration uh, and soil moisture retention, etc. cetera. Uh, may be able to draw nutrients from deeper in the soil to upper layers and then subsequent crops might be able to benefit from that translocation of nutrients. Uh, and there's, there's, so there's been many benefits that have been suggested and, and some of them documented, some of them not so well documented. Uh, hemp is naturally resistant to insect pests and predators. So there may be less need for herbicides in this crop compared to cotton or other fiber crops. Um, there's not enough of it grown yet uh, across the landscape to have um, widespread pest damage reporting and a huge need for pesticides. And in fact, there's no uh, pesticides that have been approved by the USDA or the, um, uh, the certification programs yet for uh, pests on hemp plants. It grows so rapidly, it may suppress weeds uh, and reduce the need for herbicides to kill off the weeds. <laughs> A little weird talking about hemp and weeds, but uh, anyway. Um, and there's potential here, uh, benefit here for carbon sequestration. Uh, of course, this depends on the fate of the plant and uh, where that material goes for the long-term storage of carbon, but it's hugely efficient at uh, sequestering CO2 from the atmosphere into the plant, more so than some of uh, similar sized trees out there. <clears throat> It's less water intensive compared to cotton, but it does require water at the right time, particularly during germination and uh, early stages of growth. So 
It's, it's sort of a new uh, emerging potential crop that may be more widespread in its cultivation. And we're trying to get out in front of, ahead of the curve here to understand implications for the environmental benefits, soil health, water infiltration, uh, and uh, sort of nutrient and carbon sequestration issues. Uh, just a, a quick video to end here on the field uh, outside the Stroud Center where we we did have a couple acres of the hemp fiber grow this summer. We'll be planting again uh, this, this spring and continuing our research uh, in this area as well. And that's 